Hi, and welcome to the first lesson and the initial introduction to the throughput operation strategy of Quality Craft Woodworks. First of all, being that the strategy is all about throughput, we should first clarify what throughput is. Throughput is defined as the rate at which finished product is going out the door and ready for the customer, minus the cost to produce it. It should be the focus of performance because it is the defining factor of a production line's capabilities and reflects the capacity and health of a company in a way that everyone can relate to every day. It is easy to get distracted by the idea that as long as everyone is busy, or if we have the best machines, we have a healthy production line. But the fact is that you may have high flow rate anywhere in the system, but if the flow rate is not high at the finish stage, you may be dealing with a very inefficient system. Because we only get paid for what is finished, and for what the customer is ready to receive. This is why it's important to keep an eye on throughput and seek improvements that affect throughput in a positive way. Boosting throughput is our goal as a company because it generates higher profit, which enables us to push our mission forward to promote the welfare of people and the community around us. But just as important, our throughput operation strategy includes the goal to add value to the customer and you as an employee when throughput goes up. Because we understand that people only invest in what adds value to them, we want to create more value for our customers by producing quality products efficiently to keep costs down, and we also want you to see the value in investing your time, creative mind, and energy into finding ways to boost throughput. Some of the ways we have sought to share the added value of increased throughput with our employees is through a monthly bonus program, where a percentage of the previous month's profit is given back to the employees. The ability to earn paid days off in addition to paid holidays as well as extra paid holidays are made possible when we meet throughput goals. Bonuses offered to the employee of the month as well as those who complete personal growth challenges given in our dream management challenge meetings are other ways employees can benefit from healthy throughput. The company is also seeking to budget a percentage of profit to be placed in a fund for wage increases to be distributed to those whose performance continues to add value to the company. The sky is the limit. If our throughput keeps going up, these added values to you will also go up. Hopefully now you have a pretty good understanding of what throughput is and why it is worth it for you to invest your time, creativity, and skills into increasing throughput in your area. Now we're going to discuss some of the principles and tools we can use to boost our throughput. The better you learn to understand these concepts and implement them, the better you will get at making a positive impact on our throughput. As we discuss these tools we can use for improvement, it's important to realize that any change for good begins with the individual. If we improve ourselves, it has an effect on the whole system. But it's just as important to maintain a team mentality and remember that we must learn to work with and support each other as individuals or from one department to another because we can never accomplish as much by ourselves as we can with the added talent and support of a united team effort. Let's begin with the concept of WGLL, which stands for What Good Looks Like. This concept is built on the idea that if we don't have a vision of what we want to accomplish, we will eventually drift away from a prosperous future. The statement made in Proverbs 29 is a very true principle that has been proven many times over throughout history. Success must be intentional in order to be sustained. True, sometimes success just falls in our laps, but if we aren't intentional about creating a vision of what we want to do with it, it will ultimately be lost. This vision of success can be created at any level. We have our company mission statement, which is what good looks like if we accomplish our goals as a company. And we highly encourage the implementation of this principle on a personal level by creating a personal vision statement as found in the example on this slide. This person wants to live a life of honesty, integrity, and unconditional love. She never wants to lose sight of what is most important, and she wants to make the world a better place by developing strong relationships with others. The more often she reviews and compares her current situation and actions to her goal of what good should look like, and seeks to conform her actions to achieving that goal, the quicker she will reach it. For this reason, we seek to find ways to analyze what good looks like often and think deeply about what we can do to make our vision a reality. Today we are specifically discussing throughput and what affects throughput directly, which is our production line. So let's talk about what good looks like for our production line. If you compare it to a river system where the water represents product flow, the mountains, job security, the lake, our availability of product ready for assembly to generate throughput, and the floodgates as throughput itself, or in other words, assembled products ready to be shipped to the customer, we would see a smooth flow throughout the system with no white water or obstructions in the way. Assembly would be running at full capacity all the time because they determine our throughput. 
they would be able to run at full capacity because the reservoir, or buffer, would always be filled with full job kits and have no defects. Assembly would never be slowing down due to the lack of full kits to assemble. To make it simple, we would see throughput rising and smooth, intense flow throughout the system. Part of the value of evaluating what good looks like is that we can then compare it to reality or what it looks like now. Until we obtain perfection, we will always see things that do not line up perfectly with what good should look like. We may have machines down, people sick, defects requiring rework, etc. These can be represented as boulders, bottlenecks, or backtracking streams that cause white water in the system or slow down the flow. The goal then is to eliminate turbulence in the system. Again, if we saw what good looks like in our production line, we would see throughput increasing by creating smooth, uninhibited flow throughout the production stream. Let's look at what good looks like a little closer by taking a look at these two important elements this way. Throughput can be increased in two ways, by either cutting costs or increasing production. Of course, if we can accomplish both at the same time, we will have the biggest impact on throughput. Flow is the vehicle that delivers throughput, so we must find ways to identify turbulence and remove it. The rest of this lesson will be going over principles that will help us to accomplish what good looks like. Principles that drive production up and bring costs down simultaneously by removing turbulence from our system. Let's start out by introducing you to our throughput operations strategy map. This map shows the flow of our production line and represents key elements that are important to establishing what good looks like, including what good looks like for feeding and following operations. It also represents the location of the buffer, which we will discuss later. Right now, let's begin by taking a look at the light blue area of this map. In this illustration, this area is colored blue to point out that it is the blue light of our company. The blue light is the next concept that needs some explaining as it is a great way of visualizing what determines throughput and its value. The blue light concept comes from a story that begins with a welding shop that makes automobile bumpers. This shop was having a difficult time keeping up with demand and after considering all of their options, had come to the conclusion that they just had to expand in order to keep up. Adding more welding bays would cost millions of dollars. They decided to call in a consultant to take a look before making the decision just in case he could see something that they had missed. The boss told the consultant that their shop was already running at 93% efficiency because everyone was busy and engaged in work 93% of the time and he didn't see what they could possibly do to boost production other than expand their shop. While well, the consultant came in to take a look and he told the boss right off the bat that he was confident that their shop could at least produce 25% more capacity in their current condition, an idea the boss had a hard time believing. Luckily, the consultant understood what good looks like from the perspective of throughput and its importance, whereas the boss envisioned what good looks like as people being constantly busy. Because of his perspective on throughput value, he was not so distracted and focused on just looking to see if everyone was busy, because the fact is that everyone can be busy doing work, but this doesn't mean that the work they are doing is generating throughput. In fact, sometimes it can actually be wasted activity and working against throughput. He started out by first identifying which area determined throughput. This had to be the area where products were getting finished and ready for the customers and the area in which all other work had to pass through. He quickly determined that it was the welding department. He sat down with a notebook and simply watched the welding area throughout the day and took note of what percentage of the day he saw the blue light from the welding torches burning. He noticed the welders often had to stop welding to peel stickers off work pieces that prevented them from welding. They had to stop and consult their schedule and sort parts to work on. They had to stop to restock items, etc. At the end of the day, he saw that the blue light was only burning about 5% of the working day. This means that the company had at least 95% more capacity with their current resources than they thought they had. All they had to do was keep the blue light burning. He told them to hire someone whose only job was to do the tasks that kept the welders from welding and try to keep the blue light from going out. This kid was just out of high school, but within weeks, his impact on the blue light enabled the welders to keep going, and within three weeks, they had caught up with production and produced record throughput. This is where the importance of the buffer comes in. The buffer is very important for two reasons. Number one, it acts like a storage tank of fuel to keep the blue light burning. If you envision it as a welding torch, it needs constant fuel, or it will burn out. If the tank gets low, the torch will have to be turned down in order to not go out. The goal then is to keep the tank full so the torch can not just burn, but burn at full throttle, as bright as possible. Just as important though is not just to have fuel, but what happens if the fuel is dirty? Dirty fuel will cause the flame to sputter, 
or go out periodically. It may even damage the system. This means we not only want to keep the buffer full, but we want to keep it full with complete jobs that consist of good usable parts. If we have defective parts in the buffer, or if we are missing parts to a job, this can be compared to dirty fuel, which will impact the blue light negatively. Number two, another purpose that buffer fills is the ability to absorb turbulence that happens upstream due to unplanned real life situations. It can then create a calm environment where all the issues have been worked out at our most critical point, the area that determines our throughput. Keeping a healthy buffer is one of our most important focuses because it enables the blue light to burn efficiently. Okay, let's now move on to our next concept, which is called the theory of constraints. This is basically the idea that if the blue light station is not producing at full capacity, we have a constraint upstream, also referred to as a bottleneck, which is inhibiting the flow to the blue light. To increase the blue light, we need to identify the biggest constraint upstream and seek to remove it using many of the tools mentioned in this lesson. We then move on to the next biggest constraint and so on, until the constraint becomes the blue light itself. Reaching this condition means we would be producing at maximum capacity, giving us the opportunity to focus on the blue light and increase our capacity substantially. The cycle then starts over. Understanding constraints is important because they determine our throughput no matter where they exist in the system. As you can see in this illustration, although assembly has much more capacity, they can only produce at the capacity of the biggest constraint, which in this illustration would be the door production line. Another way of putting it is that the system is only as strong as its weakest link. Another great tool to help us increase our throughput and achieve maximum flow is the concept of lean manufacturing. Lean manufacturing is basically the idea of identifying wasted activity and eliminating it. The key then is to understand what activity is waste and what activity is valuable. This is why it's important to know and ask the magic question and apply it to current activities. The magic question is, does this activity add value to the customer? This is an important question to ask in everything that we're doing because if the actions we are doing do not add value to the customer, they are not going to want to pay for it, which means the cost falls on us, and higher costs mean lower throughput. All activity falls into three categories, value added activity, non-value added activity, and non-value added but necessary activity. Non-value added activity would be activity that does not add value to the customer. We seek to eliminate this activity completely. Most companies' production line actions are typically made of 90 to 95% of non-value added activity, which means this is by far the area we have the most room for improvement in. And focusing on this area is our highest priority because it will affect throughput more than any other course of action. Value added activity is the kind of activity we need more of, and our goal is to maximize this kind of activity by coming up with better ways of doing these actions. One of the best ways to maximize value added activity is to understand waste and remove it from these kinds of activity. Non value added but necessary activities are things that may not benefit the customer directly, but do benefit them indirectly by making us work more efficiently. These kinds of activity we seek to minimize. Let's run through a few scenarios and practice asking the magic question with some of the actions we see in our workplace. Number one, is the customer willing to pay for hinges to be applied to doors? The answer would be yes, they don't want to apply the hinges themselves, so this would be value out of the activity. We should then seek to maximize this activity by thinking of better ways of doing it. Question number two, is the customer willing to pay for the assembly of face frames? Again, the answer is yes, making this a valuable activity. In this illustration, you can see examples of how these valuable activities can be maximized. Hinges can be applied using a power drill instead of a hand screwdriver. Face frames can be built faster by building a jig to automatically place rails in their proper position rather than measuring each rail individually with a measuring tape. Question 3. Is the customer willing to pay for us to spackle the back of a door? Because the back of the door is rarely seen, this does not add value to the customer, because they wouldn't know the difference if we fixed small blemishes in the back of the door or not. Therefore, they would not be willing to pay more for this process. We should then seek to eliminate this activity. Question number four, is the customer willing to pay for us to create cut lists for our jobs? The answer would be no, because they personally don't get value out of us making cut lists. But because these cut lists help to prevent us from making mistakes and help us to work much more efficiently, it is necessary activity. 
For this reason, we don't necessarily want to eliminate it, but we do want to minimize it as much as possible. A great way to identify wasted activity is to create what is called a value stream. This value stream can be done at a company-wide level all the way down to an individual process. We take each activity in the stream and analyze them individually to determine whether they are value-added or non-value-added activity. The typical company is made up of 90-95% to waste. After identifying these wastes, we can then focus on them, even more importantly than we would focus on improving value-added activity. This is because removing waste has the ability to cut costs and boost production simultaneously, boosting throughput and establishing what good looks like. This video adds some clarification to this idea. Now, when we look at any process, we typically find a large amount of non-value-added activity or waste. Now, the Japanese word for waste is muda, and as it relates to the overall lead time of a product, we normally find that this muda takes up an enormous amount of time. Oddly enough, the value-added time, or the time our customer is actually willing to pay us for, is usually very small. Unfortunately, what we often see companies do is focus on the value-added portion of the lead time. In other words, as an example, they work to save a few seconds or minutes of machine or operator cycle time in order to reduce the overall lead time. And while this isn't necessarily bad, there's far more opportunity in focusing on reducing the waste and the process first before worrying about the value-added steps. Here is another illustration showing the value behind focusing on waste instead of taking the typical approach of most companies, which is to focus on just improving value-added activity. Maximizing value-added activity is certainly not a bad thing because it does boost production, but it does not always have the added benefit of cutting costs. In fact, oftentimes the focus on boosting production can actually add to the cost of production because the waste still exists along with the expansion. For example, if a company buys a new machine to make a department bigger so they can produce more doors, they may be able to produce more doors, but if the bigger department is holding on to the same waste as before, the amount of waste grows as well. This means that even with more production, the company will not necessarily make more profit. One thing to keep in mind is that the focus on eliminating waste is floor driven. This means the changes are made by the experts on the floor, that's you, not by management trying to implement new policies or buying new machines that they hope will make a difference. Eliminating waste produces major gains at less cost, while strictly focusing only on improving value added activities produces minor gains, but oftentimes at more cost or without the added benefit of less cost. Now that we've introduced the three different kinds of activity, let's zoom into the activity of waste itself. All wasted activity fits into eight different categories. Understanding these eight different kinds of wastes can turn any one of us into waste eliminating experts. Today we'll just introduce you to these wastes, but the next lesson will focus on them in detail to help you gain the important knowledge of what they are, what causes them, and what we can do to eliminate them. One thing to note about the eight wastes is that oftentimes one waste will cause another waste, or in other words, feed it. Because of this, when we eliminate waste, we often eliminate many more along with it, making the benefits even greater. Okay, so touching on the eight wastes, the first one is defects. This is any effort caused by rework, scrap, and incorrect information. The number two is overproduction. Production that is more than is needed or before it is needed. Number three is waiting. This is any wasted time spent waiting for the next step in a process. Number four is non-utilized talent. This is when we underutilize people's talents, skills, and knowledge. Number five is transportation. Any unnecessary movements of products and materials is wasted transportation. Number six is inventory. Anytime we have excess products and materials that are not being processed, this is considered wasted inventory. Number seven, motion. Unnecessary movements by people, example, too much walking or moving around than is necessary. Number eight, extra processing or overprocessing. This is when more work or higher quality is being done than is required by the customer. Okay, before we end this lesson, I just wanna to touch on the importance of the Navy SEAL mantra, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. The Navy SEALs understand how important it is that they do the right thing right the first time because often their life depends upon it when in the line of duty. Experts of all skill levels become experts by following this principle. It is proven that far more can be done if we take our time to do it right the first time and assure quality at the source 
rather than waiting until the end of the production line to spot defects, where it has to go all the way back upstream to be fixed. Abraham Lincoln was a great example of how a man with little means to start out with rose to represent our nation during a critical time in history, and this was one of his guiding principles. Now we'll end this lesson by letting you take a quick look at this video demonstration which helps you to see how a simple task can be improved a great deal just by finding and eliminating a few wastes from the process. Check it out. Okay, this is our manufacturing site. As you can see, I got some extra help on this video. Here's employee one on the right and employee two on the left. We're very accepting of people who are different than us at Lean Smarts, but somehow these guys ended up being really similar. In any case, the products that our employees are here today to make is paper airplanes. I'm going to let them start here in just a moment, and what I want you to do is to pay close attention to their process. Look for the waste, and look for value, and ask yourself if there's a better way to make the production flow. And I'm actually going to speed it up while they work to save us some time. Here we go. Okay, employee one is starting with the folds. He's doing all five of one fold before moving on to the second fold and doing five of those. And you can see that he's doing a batch of five. Now employee two just got the batch of five and he's getting started as quickly as he can. Again, he's doing all five folds of one type and then doing all five folds of the second type until he gets done. All right, they did a great job. Or what I mean is, the process certainly does need some improvement, but even if it sucks, these guys worked pretty well. Remember that lean isn't about working our people to the bone. It's about being smarter about the process of our work. Okay, did you pay close attention? Were you looking for waste? Let's talk about a few of them. The first one that you may have seen is all the motion. I was picking up and putting down papers over and over and over because I was doing all the folds one at a time before moving on to the second fold and doing five more. Another waste that you may have seen was waiting or maybe you thought boredom. There were a few times you may have caught a yawn among our employees here. Who can blame them though? The process kind of sucks and I would be bored too if I were them. Another waste you may have seen was transportation. When department one was all done, they transported it to department two. Another waste was inventory. Now imagine if these were full scale airplanes. We'd have to have space to stage five airplanes all at the same time. Inventory is wasteful. It requires space, more overhead and utilities. It stretches everything out, so it takes more time to find what you need. Maybe that wasn't so apparent in this example, but the concept of inventory still applies. All of these wastes can be understood from the facts that by doing batch production, it's actually overproduction. Now I may have a customer who's buying five airplanes, but the fact of the matter is that department one was building five airplanes at a time, even though department two can't handle five airplanes at a time. They can do one at a time, but not five. That's overproduction. We're manufacturing things in a greater quantity than is needed by the next customer, even an internal customer, or earlier than is needed. And that overproduction results in a multiplication of all these other wastes. Now we're going to take it one more step. Not only are we eliminating the waste of motion within each department, but now let's make it flow between departments. We're going to flow each airplane into department two as soon as it's done in department one. That's going to look like this. We're going to flow through the entire value stream in one piece flow fashion. Let's go back to our manufacturing process and now see what they can do.
Okay, well, you remember the old record. It was four minutes and 59 seconds. Now doing one piece flow through both departments, we have dramatically reduced it to one minute and 47 seconds. That's a 64% improvement. I promised you that Lean could do 50% or better, and we've done it right here in this example. And I know that it's a simpler example, but it's a concept that works. It works here, and it works in a lot of manufacturing places. Well, thanks for watching this presentation. I hope this gives you an idea of what throughput is and some of the tools we can use to increase it in our workplace. Please talk to your supervisor or your throughput operations strategy manager if you have further questions regarding anything discussed in this video. Have a great day.